Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I mentioned Thursday night I was going to speak on this. The Lord's been dealing with me, and he just it really impressed me to move on with this. Spirit of Leviathan. It's mentioned a few times in the Word of God. It is the spirit of confusion and separation. You say, why would you come out of a spirit-filled moment like this to this? Because not everyone in this place right now feels what some of you feel. Because there's a twist in this. There's a confusion. There's a separation from God. Guys, you can, yeah, you can, you can be released for a few moments. In Job 41, the first eight verses say, Can you catch Leviathan with a hook? Or put a noose around its jaw? Can you tie it in with rope through the nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg you for mercy or implore for your pity? Will it agree to work for you to be your slave for life? Can you make it a pet like a bird or give it to your little girls to play with? Will merchants try to buy it? To sell it in their shops? Will its hide be hurt by spears or head by a harpoon? If you will lay a hand on it, you will certainly remember the battle that follows and you won't try that again. The spirit of Leviathan is a spirit that fights the glory that we've just been feeling in this room here in this earth. Why is it that not every church feels what we just felt and why it can't continue? There are a number of reasons. See, the anointing is the authorization in a person's life to do the works and the ministry of God in the earth. That's what the anointing is for. It sets you apart for service to God. And we know that the blood of Jesus is the detergent for sin. It washes us clean. It cleanses us. That's the blood. That's the work of the blood. But the glory of God is not the blood. And the glory is not the anointing. It's different. The glory is the weighty, manifest presence of God that sweeps over your spirit and your soul in a place like this, this morning, or in your prayer closet, or when you're driving in your car and you have to pull off to the side because tears are flowing and you feel the presence of God because you've been listening to praise music or you've been hearing a sermon and you just feel connected with God. You come into worship. And Leviathan is the spirit that tries to hinder the work of God and the worship of God and the glory of God in this world. 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you go through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have this wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. If you're insulted because you bear the name of Christ, You'll be blessed for the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. When the spirit of glory is present, it lifts the burden and the weight from you. You're not thinking any longer about the stuff of life. You feel as if you don't have a care in the world. Things are lifted. There's a a lightness. The spirit of Leviathan, though, brings confusion and and separation. And he brings heaviness. The true definition of Leviathan is it's a demonic spirit. But not just that. It is a principality. You know, we just read against principalities. What are principalities? This spirit is a principality. And it brings with it a lot of issues into our lives. It'll bring strife. It'll bring pride, arrogance, self-righteousness, self-exaltation, self-will, self-centeredness, critical attitudes, worldliness, rebellion, unforgiving spirit, all that and more. You say, wow, that sounds like me. Let me read that again. Be sure. <laughs> All these things, this Leviathan wraps around you. Attachment to the spirit of the Pharisee fights revival, fights the move of God, fights the men and the women of God. It will fight you in your life. When the glory of God comes in, when you're in the perfect will of God, you can be assured that some of the spirit of Leviathan will show up to try to distract you and to destroy you if possible. He'll divide families. He divides churches, trying to see that the glory and the presence of God is denied and doesn't show up anymore. The Leviathan spirit wants the church to be destroyed. He hates you if you're a part of the body of Christ. He wants your life and he'll, he'll try to divide you with lies and gossip and judgment and condemnation and slander and accusations. He'll try to destroy your life and your relationships and your family and your church life. 
We just want to live so that we're sure that what the accusations are are not true. That's the challenge of the Christian. How many other people say, well, there are hypocrites in the church. That's why I'm not going. They're right. So they're welcome. We welcome another hypocrite. But this sermon's all about trying to get rid of them. Not the people, but the spirit that's in them that causes that. So we don't want to give the enemy a stronghold in our life by living a lie. If we live a lie with our lives, we, we can't effectively work for God. And that's the reason a lot of people can't. They've got two different lives. We can only be effective in countering the attack of the Spirit by living in truth in every area of our life. What you say has to be who you are. What you do has to be what you do all the time. Character in the dark as well as in the light. It shows up. The Spirit, this Spirit of Leviathan carries an attitude of superiority, of haughtiness, of boasting, of arrogance. It thinks it's better than other people. He not only works in this kind of environment, but he, he attacks individuals. He attacks you in your home. He will try to destroy you in your home, making you uh, uneasy with other people. You can hear the Spirit smooth and deceptive whispering in your ear when he says, who do they think they are trying to tell you what you need to do? It's a spirit of arrogance. And this spirit promotes self and self-serving agendas. This spirit has developed false confidence in people where they think they're better. You know, Romans says, don't think yourself more highly than you ought to think. This is the spirit of Leviathan. When God is using me to preach a dynamic word, I got to keep myself aware of the constant temptation to think I've done something. This is not me today. This is the Holy Spirit of God. He is in this place. It's his voice that's speaking. When the church begins to grow like we're growing and the music and the choir begins to sound utterly amazing. It's easy for the musicians and the instrumentalists and the singers and the choir to think, man, look what we did. But that's not what it is. That's the spirit of Leviathan coming upon a person. It looks like God's favor doesn't always mean we're right with God just because we get some good things happening to us. Can't always base our life on miracles and power and electricity and casting out demons and healing and we also need to guard ourselves from the, well, I'm too good for that attitude. If the toilets need clean and you see it, don't come and report it. Grab the brush. Clean the toilet. You're not too good for that. You're a worker in the house of God. Amen. You're a person who needs to serve. This is the call of God on every life. The Spirit wants to set you up with a false self-centered confidence. It creates an identity of who we are. We've heard a lot about identity politics lately. But it's, identity politics is about what you do rather than what you are. If I can just do this, somebody's going to like me better. God will like me better. But your heavenly reputation's not based on what you do. It's based on who you are and who Christ is in you. Philippians 2, 7. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. You see, Leviathan brings rebellion into lives, opposition, defiance, resistance to those in authority. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Rebellion is anything that is against God's standards and His will. If there's any part of our lives in our homes or our churches that doesn't line up with the Word of God and with God Himself, we've got to seek to remove it. This spirit wants to get between you and the revelation of God in your life. He wants you to have the revelation of man's wisdom. He wants you to know what man knows. The word of the Lord is distorted by this Leviathan. You think it doesn't matter to you. But he will seek to hide the true revelation of God. He'll confuse the meaning of the word of God and of conversations you have in your daily life. We, we can't live by part of the word. We've got to live by all of it. The word... If, if the Word says do it, we've got to do it. If, if Jesus spoke it, then live it. The Word says no, then our answer is not maybe, it's no. This is the way we have to live our lives. We have to live different than the rest of the world. The glory of God in your home or in your church, be sure Leviathan is seeking you out. When you start getting close to God, he'll throw everything he can in your pathway to keep you from the things of God and from the house of God. 
He'll try to divide you from the things that are important, eternally important. This spirit will come and he'll disrupt the peace. I said last week, a lot of people come for counseling for the very thing that, that they were having. And then as soon as they feel better about it, they get out of church and then they end up back in counseling again because they've not been faithful to the things that got them out of the trouble in the first place. That's the spirit of Leviathan. I know some people like to live with a little bit of confusion. You've got somebody in your life that likes that. They like to be a little bit negative. Some of them like to be a lot negative. They like to stir up a little stuff from time to time. It's a game to them in a way. They think it's fun to light the fire. They're spiritual arsonists. They light the fire and love to watch it burn. Actually, that's the destructive spirit of Jezebel. And I'll get to that in a few weeks. Working alongside the spirit of Leviathan. But don't be afraid. We believers, people of God, have the power, the authority, and the dominion through the Spirit of God to overcome all these spirits with victory by the power of Jesus Christ. He said God is not the author of confusion. He said it in His Word. So if you want the glory of God in your life, you've got to stop playing games. Isaiah 27.1 In that day the Lord, with His severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and He will slay the reptile that is in the sea. This is God Himself. God will do this. The Lord with his strong sword. He'll punish this crooked serpent. This twisted serpent. When the glory of God is manifesting and settling in a place, the spirit of Leviathan will always show up. He does not want us to be in the glory of God. Revival after revival has come and gone. People say, why doesn't uh, why didn't revival stay? I said it last week. I said, uh, one of the great ministers of the gospel lady said, why does revival come and why does it go? Why, I don't understand. Why even have it? He said, well, why does the bath come and go? Why even have that? Because <laughs> it's a cleansing time. It's a purifying time. It's a time when, when you get close to God and you, you feel God move. Confusion from Leviathan is always something that will trouble a church. Always. And let me tell you, no weak-worded, pansy, little, powerless, in-and-out Christian will be able to manage the spirit of Leviathan. It's going to take somebody who's a sword-wielding, armor-clothed warrior that's skilled in the Word to take his head off. If you're playing games, you won't be able to combat it. It will take you down. You want to fight an alligator without a knife or a gun? It's exactly what it would be. Jump in the water. Wrestle that alligator for a while. If you don't have the right armor on and the right, right weaponry, you won't win that battle. You'll be consumed. You think you can make up your own version of what the Word says to make it easier for you to call yourself a Christian. You'll die spiritually. I'm telling you. It says it. It means it. It's the truth, not facts. There are facts involved in the truth. But many times there's no truth involved in facts. Think about it. If you don't believe me, just go to Facebook. (laughs) Somebody said to me this week, it's on Facebook, must be true. (laughs) Don't believe for a minute you're a match for this powerful spirit that twists. We talked about Python a few weeks ago. It squeezes the breath out of you. But this spirit just twists things around, just confuses things. Satan was the serpent. In the garden that twisted the word of God. Think about it. Uh, Genesis 3.1. This is in the voice. It says, is it true that God has forbidden you to eat fruits from the trees of the garden? And then verse 4. The serpent said, die? No, you will not die. God's playing games with you. The truth is that God knows the day you eat the fruit from that tree, you'll awaken something powerful in you and become like him, possessing knowledge of both good and evil. And in Revelation Thirteen four. people worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast and they also worship the beast and ask, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Heard this story. Let me use it as an example. Man said, it's one of the worst experiences of my life. I felt like I was watching a train wreck in slow motion. I couldn't do anything to stop it. A great friendship that I had was breaking up. We'd been close, but things were getting strained. I couldn't put my finger on it. But somewhere beneath the surface of our forced smiles and tense conversations, an ominous influence seemed to be moving closer. Words of peace became strangely warped. 
Confusion and suspicion caused whispered lies. Then suddenly, a firestorm of words and attitude. And then it was over. We'd come apart. The relationship was done. I never saw it coming. If you've ever experienced the pain of an unexpected relational meltdown, it could be in marriage, it could be in friendship, it could be in family, it could be with your children. Look for Leviathan. Look for a spirit. A lot of times, the person that's speaking is speaking out of a spirit that's not their own spirit, but a spirit that they've allowed to take place of their own spirit. Speak for them. Now, I, I'm not a demon chaser. I don't believe there's a demon on every doorknob, behind every bush. But I know demons are real. How many believe in angels? Then you've got to believe in demons. Easy to believe in angels. They're the good guys, the white hats. But we don't want to believe in the, the dark side. But they're real too. And when you experience these kinds of things, you must look beyond the words of another person or even yourself and go, why did I say that? What was that about? Why was I trapped into creating this kind of situation and, and not being able to let go? It's the spirit of Leviathan. It's behind it all. Twisting the communication, twisting the ideas, twisting the words. Matthew 18, 15. In situations like this, the Bible's clear. I'm going to give you some teaching here because this is the way to handle circumstances and situations that create trouble and problems in relational situations. Here's what it says. If another believer sins against you. Now how many know that I've said to you recently, I choose not to be offended. You can say whatever you want to. Leave my kids and my wife out of it because I might get a little hot on that one. Say what you want to about me. You can say it to my face. You can say it behind my back, but I will not be offended. Why? I'm not any holier than you. I've just chosen that I will not be offended. You cannot do it to me because I've chosen not to. So if a brother or sister sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others, and I would say praying people who are neutral, who are neutral, praying, Holy Spirit-filled, wise people, take one or two others with you and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or an IRS guy. Well, actually, it says, it says corrupt tax collector, sorry. So what does that say to us? Best way to work it out is between you and that other person. Go with a forgiving spirit. Don't let the spirit of Leviathan have its way anymore. See, that's how the spirit sows discord in my brothers and sisters in the church. In your marriage or in your general life, have, have you ever said something that was taken the wrong way? And some will say, you said this. And you say, no, I didn't say that. I said this. And, and it goes back and forth. And you both think you're right. And this twisted, confusing spirit of Leviathan makes you think that's not what they said. And that's not what they said. And that what you said is the right thing. And that's the only way it can be. You said black. <clears throat> they, excuse me. You said black. They hear it as blue. You say red. They hear it as green. You say purple. They say, no, it's white. You said white. And it creates dissension. Leviathan wants to get in between the conversation and your hearing to distort what the other person said. And it's generally because what we are thinking is the way we filter it. So it happens that we're in a better place. This can happen between husbands and wives, family members, friends, children, grown children, even small children. Leviathan wants to twist words, especially the promises of God, so that we don't realize What's happened? And when you become aware of this attack in your life, you can learn how to handle it. You simply say, Spirit of Leviathan, I see what you're doing. It has been revealed to me in my prayer or through the word or through this sermon or through another teaching. I know what you're doing and I bind you in Jesus' name. Get out of my life and stop this activity now in the name of Jesus. We have the power. The Bible says what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
Spirit of confusion, separation. And you're not alone in this. Listen. Relationships in the church of Jesus Christ are under attack everywhere. It's just what we're living with in today's world. But God is uncovering the way these spirits operate. These secret spirits. While the powers of Leviathan is real, the spirit of confusion and separation are no match for an equipped believer who's spirit-filled, who, has, who knows who he is, and has the authority of the power of Jesus. Isaiah 27, 1. Look at it again. In that day, the Lord, and usually the Lord in the Old Testament is Jesus, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he'll slay the reptile that is in the sea. Isaiah sees him as a spiritual enemy. It is the spirit that's working against you. He's a supernatural serpent from the dark side of supernatural life, the principality that must be defeated, and in the end, the Leviathan spirit is slain. His clear mission is to destroy, to destroy your life and your life and your life and this church. Let me give you another illustration. Ray and Susan come to a new church, okay? Now, these are fictitious names. I don't know Ray and Susan. They come with high hopes, and the first service was refreshing. They liked it. They're warmly welcomed, the new pastor. They thought it was wonderful. They saw humility and love in this pastor. Before long, they were heart deep in the new church home, and they wanted to work in there. They wanted to get involved. They, and Ray says, I'm so glad we found this church. He tells the pastor, this is a perfect church. Well, not really, because they joined it. But same thing would happen when you find the perfect church, don't join it. You'll ruin it, okay, because we're humans. In fact, those folks who come to, to membership, uh, we give out a thing, this is not the perfect church. And it's a comedy thing, but, but it really is true as well. So it was subtle, but on one Sunday, things begin to shift in Ray's mind. Pastor Peterson was giving a report about a recent outreach, and Ray was sitting there listening to the report, and he's thinking, I think he's taking credit for what God's doing. He want us, wants us to think he's responsible for the souls being saved and people being helped. And this same thought repeated itself in different ways until Ray was persuaded that the pastor had a spiritual problem, that he was taking too much credit for everything that was going on. Well, let me tell you a thing. Things around here, I get no credit and I want no blame, okay? Just know that. You don't, have to, you don't have to give me any credit because I don't want any blame either. It's somebody else's fault. So Ray was persuaded. Now, I mean, nothing had changed from the first day they got there when it was such a perfect church. And this day, same pastor, same heart, same beliefs, same church, same group of people. And this repeated itself in different ways until Ray was persuaded that this pastor had this Deep spiritual problem. Susan, his wife, didn't agree, but he kept on saying it. So he set up a meeting with pastor. He came in with intimidating words, judgmental spirit, very harsh, very accusatory. And Pastor Peterson was stunned, and he didn't know the reason for this. Ray's views seemed so twisted and so disconnected. It's like nothing seemed to fit. Susan just looked at the floor. Ray refused to pray with the pastor. Instead, he said, no, I'm not going to pray with you. You have a spiritual problem. I think it's best we just part ways. I don't know what we ever saw in this church in the first place. Within the year after leaving, the same dynamics emerged in their marriage. Ray began to be more and more accusatory of Susan. Words were warped. Communication strained. Hearts grew hard and bitter. Ray and Susan separated, and eight months later, they were divorced. Now, why all that? Why do I say that? Because the enemy targets relationships. He wants to destroy good people's lives. Amen. One of the best ways he can do it, with your words, with your thoughts, with your attitudes. Ephesians 4.16 says we need each other. We need to love each other. We need to care for each other. It's important. Our connections with each other are critical. They, they deliver the love and the power we need to continue living life for Christ. Ephesians 4.16, from whom the whole body joint and knit together with what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying itself of itself is loved. You know, David over in Psalm 56 said, they're always twisting what I say, 56.5 in the New Living. They're always twisting what I say. Even David, even David had that, uh, that problem. 
So Leviathan is more than a demon, and I want you to get this today. It's a principality. It's an authority from the dark world of the, the devil himself. He'll seek ways to hide true revelation. Meaning of things, he'll twist them. The communication of what the word should be won't be clear. You'll think things that they said that, you, that they didn't say. And this is how the ugly spirit shows dis, sows discord among the brethren and shows himself to be real. We have to be alert. We have, you know, there's a law called recognition. We have to have the law of recognition, which is a spiritual discernment, which brings us to the place of recognizing quickly, why can I not be offended? Why can I say I choose not to? Because I've asked the Lord to help me to discern the spirit behind the words. When you know the spirit behind the words, you realize that it's not always that person that's speaking those words. There's a spirit that they've allowed, to, and I'm not saying they're demon possessed. I'm simply saying they've allowed this spirit to kind of drop into their lives, into their being, and it's a part of what happens with them on a daily basis. Acts 15, even the apostles and prophets and pastors fall into a spirit of division. It says uh, 1536 Acts. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's now go back and visit the brethren in every city where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. But Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted they should not take them, the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became, now this is, this is apostles, the, the, this contention became so sharp, they parted from one another. And Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed. See, the rhythm is always the same in these situations. Twisting, confusion, separation. Twisting, confusion, separation. Twisting, confusion, separation. Always the same. We need to be vigilant. We need to be aware and use the law of recognition to see the signs of any spirit of Leviathan. The spirit of the enemy coming in. Don't forget, we're battling a spirit that's trying to destroy the glory of God in your life and in this church. Don't forget, the words you speak identify you. The words are important. We've got to be careful what we say. The words you speak set the boundaries of your life. The words you speak affect your spirit. Did you know your spirit is always listening to your words? Your spirit. Not the spirit. Your spirit. I'm always sick. Your spirit hears that. Your spirit won't fight back because you've claimed that over your very life. Words are spiritual. They carry power, creative power. Spirits are attached to words that we speak. It's either the spirit of life, Proverbs says, or the spirit of death. Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your core being, you will speak. The words you speak really tell us who you are. So words create things. God created the universe with his words. Facebook's a good example. Someone says something innocuous. Now, I don't go on there much. And I'm glad. Song said, I'm so glad. So you put something out there. Someone responds. Uh, if you want to go to private messages, you could tell me more because I really want to pray. So sorry to hear about your trouble. You can tell me more if you want to. And so the twisting and the confusion might begin right there. When we don't acknowledge the fact that we can be drawn in, you better pray about it before you start getting deep into a conversation with someone about someone else or about something else. Be careful. The trap is set. The bait is there. You have to be very careful. You, you can never fix your own life by attacking someone else's. You never will. You don't want to be dragged down. Remember, your words have power. So if we as a church are going to defeat the enemy whose purpose is to destroy us, we've got to be more committed than ever to stand strong in the Spirit of the Lord. We've got to be more committed than ever to do what 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says. Therefore, encourage one another. Who have you encouraged this week? Call out their name right now. Who have you encouraged? Who else? Call, call their names out. Who have you, who have you intentionally encouraged? You've got to live intentionally. Who have you intentionally encouraged this week? You speak their name out loud. That's all right. Go ahead. That's all right. All over the building. Now, if I said, who have you spoken against this week? Call their name out all over the building. Hmm. <laughs> there you go. Got one. 
Believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, don't need to be trapped by the bait and the trap of the enemy. Encourage one another. Build each other up. This is why we do it. Speak encouragement words. Speak faith words. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life. You can speak words of death. You can speak words of life. You know, in our pain, we can become self-righteous like Job was. Uh, in Job 41, God's saying, Look at yourself, Job. Look at your self-righteousness. You, you'd have to read this. I'm not going to take time this morning. He was saying pride and pain are ruling you and twisting your perception of what's going on in your life. Pain causes that. When hurting people hurt other people. You've heard that before, right? It's so true. And the only way not to hurt is to go to God and say, God, I repent. Sorry for my spirit. Sorry for my attitude. This is what I really like about Job's story. Job 42, 6 said, he said about himself, therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. When's the last time you did that? He humbled himself before the Lord. And you know what God did in 10, 42, 10, and the Lord restored Job's losses. We said a moment ago, faithful. He's restoring. We sang it, faithful, faithful. God is restoring to me what I've lost. If you want that, you do what Job did. Repent in dust and ashes and say, God, I haven't recognized the evil that's in my life. And I, I want to be cleansed by your Holy Spirit power. He restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice as much. Pretty good exchange. I mean, to invest in something like that, if you knew that you're going to get twice as much back, well, maybe not because of the pain he went through and the loss he had. Because when pain and loss pierce our souls, it hurts us deeply. But the enemy plays off these wounds, see. When you start feeling sorry for yourself, gather other people around you who pat you on the back and say, yeah, you've got a right to feel that way. Yeah, you should feel that way. Look what they did to you. Look how they've hurt you. And the devil jumps right on that with this spirit of Leviathan and he twists those words and he, you don't feel any better, but well, you're glad people around you feeling as bad as you are. <laughs> Why does that make us feel better? When we get people around us, who feel, we make them feel just as bad as we are and it makes us feel better. <laughs> well, let's be clear with ourselves. First John 1 John 1.8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves truth is not in us. If we buy the lie that says that we're not ever wrong, it's all about them, their problems, what they're doing, division begins, it begins to take hold. And we don't see it coming. And Leviathan can only be defeated if we walk humbly before the Lord. How, how, do, we, how do we defeat this? Humility will cause us to see that everything in life's not all about me. I said it many times, that little book, in my library back here, I was always on my mind. It's a book. It's about this very thing. All life is about me. Will we be humble and thankful that in this humility we find the reality of what God's doing? That we can defeat this enemy of our lives? We find the grace of God working in our lives. We realize that we have been wrong. When the light finally shines, it's, it's not that we are perfect. It's that we are only perfected in Him. Humility creates an atmosphere of grace, filled with grace all around our lives. When there's toxicity, this grace removes it, cleanses it. We begin to give grace instead of accusations, instead of condemnation. And did you know that Leviathan can't breathe in the atmosphere of the oxygen of grace? Let me tell you this. I want you to get this. If you get nothing else, this spirit will die in the atmosphere. How many know if you, if you jumped out of the space shuttle, you would die in a matter of seconds? Why? No oxygen. So we are here on this earth because of the atmosphere that's filled with oxygen. No oxygen, no life. You want to kill Leviathan? Live in the atmosphere of grace. What's grace? Undeserved favor. Undeserved forgiveness. Undeserved words 
of encouragement. Undeserved life, giving your life for another. How did Jesus prove grace? He gave his life for you. He gave his last breath for you. If that doesn't spell out what grace is, then nothing can. Listen, I, I'm, I'm telling you, Leviathan will be suffocated when your life becomes a grace-filled life. If you're in a relational conflict, pray for those with whom you're struggling. Ask God to give them grace. Let the Lord restore your losses like He did Job when you repent and say, God, this is not all about them. This is also about me. Yeah, they might have been wrong, Lord, but so have I been wrong. Pride born of hurt is fertile soil for a Leviathan spirit. Bitterness because of what someone did, abuse or, or trouble or accusations, fertile soil. That spirit will grow quickly. First Peter 5, 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you, all of you, all of us, say all of us, includes me. No, that was lighter than all of us. Wait a minute. All of us includes me. He says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Best of all, I've learned that God will restore when we get our hearts in order. You want to defeat Leviathan? Get your heart in order because you'll have a heart filled with grace. God will take a heart of stone out of you and give you a heart of flesh. He promised that. When God told Job to pray for his friends, I, I don't think he'd have done that unless he'd forgiven them. You can't pray for somebody you haven't forgiven. You can say words, but I'm talking about praying from your heart. You can't pray from your heart for someone that you have unforgiveness against. And I believe Job's heart and his attitude please God. And that's why God responded. And God doubled up. Doug, come on back. So when we repent, we get double for our trouble. <laughs> that's a good investment. You struggle. You fought. You've been angry. You've said harsh words. You've had a bitter spirit. Remember whose spirit that is. It's the spirit of the enemy. It's the Leviathan spirit. You can humble yourselves and repent like Job did. We need to deploy some unconventional weapons in this battle, like repentance and forgiveness. We need, to, we, need, we need to have a heart full of grace. Changes everything. Thank God, Luke tells us we've been given authority. Luke, 9, Luke 10, 19. And this is from The Voice again. Now you understand that I've imparted to you all my authority to trample over his kingdom. You will trample upon every demon before you and, over, and you and overcome every power that Satan possesses. Absolutely nothing will be able to harm you as you walk in this authority. Jesus said, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. I give you authority over the power of the demonic. I give you power over the power of Leviathan. I give you power over the power of the python. I give you power and it's called grace. Grace. Sometimes we miss, we think power is all with the sword and beating people up and, and cutting off their heads of the enemy. A lot of times the power he gives you is a very quiet power called grace. Grace that forgives. Grace that loves. Grace that replaces bitterness. Grace that replaces hatred. Grace that replaces all the things that the enemy wants to bring into your life. I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly in Jesus' name.